Hi, Katz. I'm Marty Kine, uh, SVP of Strategy at Salesforce. I'm doing a side project here, which are my back to work webinars and it's sort of the greatest hits of all the webinars I've put together over the years that I'm particularly fond of. And this is my favorite of all, the marketing secrets of Taylor Swift and cats. I added cats at the end. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about um, this person. Do any of you recognize her? I think you probably do. That is uh, Taylor Swift. And I'm not actually talking about the person, Taylor Swift. I've never met her, Taylor Allison Swift. She apparently was uh, grew up on a Christmas tree farm in uh, Pennsylvania. She moved to uh, Nashville. Uh, her parents um, quit their jobs or, or relocated, her father relocated, and her mother devoted herself to her career. And of course, the, uh, the end result is something that we can all enjoy to this day. Uh, but what I'm actually interested in is Taylor Swift as a brand and as a brand marketer and as somebody who has analyzed advertising and marketing over the years, I became very fascinated with Taylor Swift. She seemed to be a unique sort of brand that we could all learn from. Um, she is somebody who is adaptable. She has been, um, she signed deals with people like Diet Coke and, and Target and Verizon and Keds over the years. And she can sort of fit her brand alongside another brand and yet maintain her own integrity. Um, so what are you going to learn from this webinar, this quick webinar. Number one, she's a master marketer. Obviously, it's a very successful brand over the years. What is she doing? What is she doing? And I would argue she's doing something quite unique. Um, how does she do it? So there are seven rules for branding. I'll tell you what they are. She breaks them all. Taylor Swift actually as a brand breaks them all. What does that tell us? Maybe those rules aren't so great. And then how you too can turn a blank space into your wildest dreams. Your name here, people. It's time to be Taylor. So what can we observe about Taylor? Well, first of all, there was a meme a few years ago about how people uh, looked like Taylor Swift or they knew someone who they thought looked like Taylor Swift. It was on Instagram. So people would post pictures. Here's my girlfriend. Uh, here I am with Taylor Swift. And actually, it wasn't Taylor Swift. And Taylor even weighed in. Weighed in. You can see that picture there uh, from 1989. The, the album around the time 1989 the album came out and she had that picture it says no it's Becky and <laughs> this was from me probably a lot of you saw this but somebody posed with Taylor with Taylor Swift and then the boy the guy who, who she was with was saying well, actually it's not Taylor Swift that's my girlfriend Becky and then Taylor Swift wore this t-shirt saying no it's Becky and in fact it was Becky but uh w well what does that mean well there are a lot of people do think they look like Taylor Swift okay fine then people insult Taylor Swift. So occasionally a celebrity is so stupid as you know to come out in public and say something like uh, like Kanye, you know, at the awards, he he sort of stepped on her a little bit. Jared Leto said something insulting. Um, Amy Schumer talked about thigh gap sort of thing. What happens though? Immediately they have to come out and and apologize. It's a strange phenomenon. You cannot, you literally cannot insult Taylor Swift. And it's not that there is um, an upswell of, and a public outcry and they're worried about their own brand. These people seem sort of compelled in their own way to come out and say, I'm sorry, Taylor, I actually didn't mean it. Uh, she is un insultable. She can't be insulted. And another thing, I think I, I align this with the meme of people who think they look like Taylor, uh, is um, uh, that album that came out by... Um, that guy down there on the bottom, 1989, he actually remade, um, this is, uh, the great Ryan Adams and Ryan Adams remade 1989 song for song, literally note for note. So he's doing his own sort of, I love Taylor meme. Um, if you look at the analytics now around her fans, so I try to do sort of celebrity analytics and look, look at the analytics around her, her fans. Look on, on um, it, uh, Twitter, Taylor Swift 13, that's her handle. So uh, if, you, if you use a, a tool like Finio, which does sort of subgroups or sub tribes within the overall tribe. So if you look at all the people who said they've liked um, Taylor Swift on 13 publicly identified, there are a lot of strange little sub tribes in there. There's a group who like comedy, which you might expect, but then there's also a news and politics junkie group. There's a group who like uh, BET, then there's Teen Girl Humor, you might expect that. But what's this WWE fan? So wrestling fans. Uh, they like Taylor as well. Directioners, pop culture mommies. And these are the descriptions that people put in their, in their Twitter bio about um, how, we, how they would describe themselves. You see, they're actually quite positive. It's life. Uh, some people are a writer. They said they're a lover. Lover. It's nice. An enthusiast. And the affinities of these people, obviously, they skew a lot toward country music because she still has a strong country 
fan base, but there are a lot of others as well. As I said, the basketball fans, rock band fans, um, wrestling fans. So I, what I took from this is that she has a, a broad appeal to a lot of different people who ha might, you think, have different um, interests. Even groups that sometimes disagree, agree about one thing, which is Taylor Swift. I actually commissioned this study. It was before um, she's become a little bit more political recently. But last year, for instance, she was um, fairly apolitical. And if you ask Democrats, how do you feel about Taylor Swift? Well, 13% they, they loved her, 34% liked her, and so on. Republicans, it was, you know, fairly much the same. It was, you know, 17% said they hated her, Republicans, 23% of Democrats. Um, the proportions are similar. And so that made me think, well, you know, it seems as though these groups who are different in so many ways, they can't agree on anything, do agree on Taylor Swift. And, um, what about these people who say they don't like Taylor Swift, they hate Taylor Swift? Well, um, there is 20%, so 20%, one in five people in, in the US, this was a US sample, say they hate Taylor Swift. I was wondering about those people. So who, who are these people? I, I don't know them, you don't know them, but um, what, can we, what can we say about them? Well, what kind of a person hates Taylor Swift? So uh, I had this survey company, Civic Science, do an intercept survey of those people who said they hated Taylor Swift. So this is the 20%. And they, we posed this question to them. How are you feeling today? Just how do you feel today? And the answer they came back with was pretty bad. These are sad people, kind of sad, totally miserable. I would put them on the, you know, the doer end of the sad doom and gloom. And so the takeaway here is that people who hate Taylor Swift hate life. That's very interesting, because what that tells me is that when people are talking about their feelings toward Taylor Swift, they're actually talking about themselves. So let's ponder that. Who is Taylor Swift? Who is she? Well, there was a sociologist called Emil, Emil Durkheim in the late 19th century, and he came up with this concept of a totem. It's a little bit complex, but essentially it boils down to this. There is a group of people, and it was on Australia, New Zealand, so a tribe, and they, um, they worshipped a, uh, a stone, so they would, or an object, we'll say. So they would um, uh, imbue it with some power, they, they, they would um, put designs on it, and then they would worship it, and it would be, the symbols on the stone would be the symbol of their tribe. So what Emil Durkheim, Emil Durkheim said was that actually in worshiping this totem, which was an object outside themselves, this tribe was worshiping themselves. And it was a way to lend coherence to the group. They were respecting themselves, but they were doing it in an indirect way. They were holding themselves together with this sort of totemization. And I think Taylor Swift herself is a totem. Taylor Swift does not exist. She's a blank space on which fans project their ideal self and I think that she is pointing the way toward what a modern brand should be, which I call an unbrand. And she is the ultimate and quintessential unbrand. What do I mean by brand? Well, it's the opposite of uh, unbrand, is the opposite of a brand. And what is a brand? Here's a definition from a textbook. It's something that is publicly distinguished from other products. And you can probably see where I'm going with this. When I worked, back when I worked at the agency, we had a car company, luxury car company as a, um, client and they they wanted to define their brand and they went through a pretty typical process you go into simmons mri it's a big database of um, attitudes of a cross-section of the population pull out groups so you'd find your segment rigorously defined segment it would be a sort of subset of the population you'd stake out your brand space you make sure it's different from all your competitors and you determine what your brand means as distinguished from everything else because it would appeal to your group of people and you come up with some messaging that would appeal to them. I would argue that actually most modern brands who are successful don't do that at all. They don't, they don't create what we would call a brand and they don't stake out their own space. What they do is um, they're blank spaces. We don't really know that much about them unless they get in some kind of political trouble. But if, you, if we look at, uh, we may know, think, think something about Elon Musk, but what about Tesla as a brand? What, what, what can I say? What about Google for that, for that matter? Um, you know, are they, uh, I don't know, eco-conscious? Are they uh, friendly, unfriendly? I mean, who knows? I, I can project onto them whatever I want. I can hate them or I can love them, but I'm talking about myself. And so Taylor Swift as an unbrand, I think was a revolutionary. She, she breaks the rules. What's the difference? Brands, brand, traditional branding is supposed to have a point of view. They talk about themselves. 
They're like, this is what I do. I do X, Y, and Z. I ride the trends. I'm going to do trend jacking. You know, if uh, millennials are cool, my brand's going to be all about millennials. What does Taylor do as an unbrand? She doesn't have a point of view. I don't know what her point of view is on anything. Um, she doesn't talk about herself. She does a lot of listening, listening parties. You tell me, you tell me what, what, um, what you think about me. How can I improve? Um, ride the counter trends. This is a really a good one, actually, because for every trend, there's a counter trend. And if I would say, sum up pop music in the era of Miley Cyrus, which is when Taylor got really popular, um, the trend was towards sexualization at younger and younger ages. It was really kind of gross. But Tay Tay, on the other hand, wasn't like that. She seemed actually like a quite nice young woman and she dressed nicely. She was someone who I think any boy would be happy to bring home to his mother. And uh, that's a counter trend. There was, she, was un, she, was, she could be sexy or appealing, but she was unsexualized. And that's the counter trend she was riding. So the seven, there's seven ha bad habits of brands, I would say, to be reductive here. Uh, number one, they go big. So they're trying to appeal to a lot of people. So they're trying to offend as few people as they can. They are not people. They're, they're different than us. They're out there. They, they exist in the ethosphere. They go with the flow. So if there's a trend, as I said, they'll go with it. They talk a lot. They, they try to be entertaining. You know, they're like, uh, like me, like me, like me. I want to be like. They're sort of like uh, Jay Moore used to be, you know. He's like <laughs> last comic standing. This is, uh, it's all about me. And, and they are not us. The unbrands are act absolutely the opposite. Rather than going big, they go home. They focus on their core fan base. So she was uh, country music. She would serve, the, she served the country group. Then she expanded a little bit into younger women who, you know, had boyfriend troubles and then expanded a little bit, built on a base, a base that I would call the home base rather than going big to begin with. Um, they are human. She's very human. I would say she's very human. I, at least that's how I project her to be. Go against the flow. So it's a counter trend. Uh, if there's a massive trend, why don't you try to find something else? Something that's sort of the opposite. Now, do a lot of listening. As I said, she's a very uh, interested person. She holds listening parties with her fans. She will invite them into, uh, I don't know if it's Zoom, whatever video software she uses, and, uh, and play the album, play the new album for them, see what they think, uh, are real. So she doesn't necessarily have to be the funniest person in the room. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be like, she stood up against Apple. She stood up against streaming services for a while. Uh, when they, she felt that she was being mistreated, it doesn't, it's not all about making sure that big companies like me. Um, a certain amount of independence is respected. And ultimately the message that she's giving is that she's, she is us. She's in our tribe. She's one of us. And it actually doesn't matter what tribe I'm in. This is the genius of the unbrand. I can be in, you know, some tribe, which I am here in Katona, New York, and I can say Taylor is one of us. She is. Why? Because I'm projecting our tribe onto her. Someone can be, you know, across the country somewhere in a completely different tribe, someone I have nothing in common with me personally. They can look at Taylor and say she's one of us. Why? Because they're projecting themselves on her. That's the genius of the unbrand. So recommendations for Tay Tay. Tay Tay says turn up her album, whichever one you like. I happen to like 1989. Study your biggest believers. Who loves you the most as a brand? Who is it? Who are the people who actually care? Figure out who they are, what makes them tick, and make your product for them. Make your message chatty, so be human, be conversational, be flawed, have vulnerabilities. Don't try to be perfect. Look at counter trends. There's a lot, there's a lot of opportunity there. Uh, listening, listening, listening. You get the point. <laughs> Talk about the product, not the talk. So make it real, you know? If your product doesn't do something, you can get a lot of mileage out of saying, my product actually doesn't do that. That's not what I'm going for. I'm not trying to um, paint you some smoke and mirrors. And then Flex Appeal, make your totem portable to any tribe. So what about cats? How are cats related to this? Well, stick with me here for a moment. So there's my cat, Jerry. He's a very handsome fellow. And what can we say about him? Other than his extreme good looks and his striking ears and orange color, and the fact that he does uh, enjoy musical instrument cases very much, Tay-Tay uh, Tay -Tay and cats have in common the fact that um, we don't really know them. We don't know their essence or their core. And so we can project onto them. They're really a very good blank space for us to project onto them what we want. And I would argue with cats, we don't know what they're thinking. In fact, if we knew what they were thinking, we probably wouldn't like them as much as we do. And I say this with great affection for my friend Jerry there. Um, cats are not expressive. 
they're not like dogs. They don't emote and their faces are not particularly expressive. So I think they're you know, the ideal canvas for us to project on. Um, I hope this helps you get back to work. Jerry and I wish you all the best. If you'd like to contact us, just ping us there. Thank you very much.